Welcome to GTS Car Life. I'm Thomas. GTS Car Life is dedicated to presenting today's car culture. Five car guys, four car guys. Have you ever wondered what it's really like to go amateur auto racing? Today, we're going to find out. questions from friends and acquaintances about what it's like to drive a race car and how to get started. This is for you and for them. Just the thought of trying your hand at amateur auto racing can be very intimidating, but it doesn't need to be. Amateur auto racing is a very popular worldwide sport. There are many different organizations and sanctioning bodies set up for people just like us who start out with nothing but a real passion for fast cars, a strong desire to learn, and a dream. But how do you gain the skills and a license to one day compete against other race car drivers? There are many and varied options out there, but which one will be right for you? We're going to take a look at some of the most popular and most enjoyable paths to taking the green flag starting right now. There are many different paths you can choose to obtain a competition license. These include carts, arrive and drive track experiences, autocross, just for fun track days, organized HPDE programs, and dedicated race schools. Most professional race car drivers got their start in go-karts or carts. Most major cities and many racetracks offer karting tracks as well. Carts can come with electric or gas power and can range from kid-friendly slow models all the way up to 80 mile per hour racetrack terrors. The professional drivers generally started their karting careers around age six or earlier. For our purpose, I'm going to assume you are more than six years old and you're looking for a path a bit quicker than this. Some folks may have gotten their first taste of track driving at a driving experience, like exotics racing, extreme experience, or the Richard Petty experience. Despite what some of them may want you to think, these experiences are really just for fun. You get to drive a cool car pretty fast on track, but don't expect to learn anything significant and you won't really be any closer to that competition license. Next up are companies that allow you to drive your own car on track for fun. Some of these are members only. Sometimes it's even the track itself who hosts these. The upside is that you'll get to drive on track, but like the Exotics experience, you won't be learning a whole lot. So tread lightly if you sign up for one of these events. This brings us to the two options that actually can lead to your own competition license. High Performance Drivers Education, or HPDE programs, and racing schools. There are plenty of HPDE programs from organizations like Sports Car Club of America, National Auto Sport Association, Edge Addicts, Chin Motorsports, Speed Ventures, and many others. There's almost certainly one near you. HPDE programs are offered by many different companies. Some, like NASA and SCCA, are available nationwide. Others are more regional and may be limited to certain states or cities. At the heart of these programs is the ability for you to sign up without previous experience and bring your own car to a racetrack near you. Once there, you'll receive a combination of classroom instruction and on-track driving time, usually with an experienced instructor either in your passenger seat or leading in a car ahead of you. Some of these organizations also offer autocross options, which amounts to the easiest, least expensive way to gain experience in your car and compete against others. It's not uncommon for a driver to start with autocross, then move up through ascending HPDE levels and time trial before earning a competition license. In fact, that's how I did it. The options here are numerous. Google HPDE in your area, and you're sure to find something not too far away. A big advantage of some nationwide organizations, like NASA and SCCA, is that they are also sanctioning bodies. This means that in addition to offering HPDE courses, they also sanction organized series racing, like FIA and NASCAR at the top, and World Racing League, Le Mans, and Chump Car. So you can literally start at the bottom as a complete beginner and work your way up from HPDE 1 through the various levels. Then, when your experience and skills reach that next level, you can sign up for their competition license course, take the test, and upon passing, begin racing with the same organization and same friends that you've gotten to know and love from the beginning. And that truly is huge, because one of the best things about amateur auto racing is the camaraderie and friendships you'll make along the way. 
Despite the competitive nature of auto racing, you'll be pleasantly surprised to find that camaraderie is one of the best aspects of club racing. You'll battle for every spot on track, but in the pits, it's a whole different matter. Racers are always the first to offer assistance, parts, advice, and friendship. Some of the best memories and closest friends I have are ones I gained working my way up through HPTE, time trial, and eventually wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing. Amateur auto racing is a tight-knit group of like-minded individuals who share a passion for automobiles and motorsports. A majority will be self-employed since it requires a significant amount of time and money to compete for the full schedule. It really adds so much to the experience caravanning to and from the racetrack, discussing past and upcoming weekends in person and on Facebook race group pages, hanging out in the garages and sharing stories of how you almost lost it in turn seven, meeting other families and heading out to dinners together. Another advantage is that both NASA and SCCA are recognized nationally and a competition license issued by either of them will be accepted by most other racing organizations. Sure, you can sign up for one of the ultra expensive professional driver schools and go through a full series there. That will accomplish your goal, but you'll miss out on much of the experience. Find a local club and get involved at the beginning level, whether that's autocross or HPDE. Some clubs, like Porsche Club of America, even have a half day introductory course. This leaves us with the professional racing schools. Some people assume an expensive professional racing school is the best or the only way to achieve a competition license. It is one option, and if you have the money and time to commit, it may be the fastest. Professional racing programs like Skip Barber Racing School can charge $7,000 or more US for a three-day course. These programs provide the cars and the track, as well as professional classroom and on-track instruction. Competition license programs from companies like Porsche can cost two or three times that amount and require many more days. The instruction from these professional schools is no doubt top-notch. But the old saying about there being no replacement for experience definitely applies here. Some things take time. Learning the skills necessary to be a safe and competitive racer and developing them to the point where you can compete at a high level requires a lot more time than was provided in any compacted course. There's a certain wisdom you can only gain from the time and many, many different experiences. Other drawbacks include the fact that these schools generally operate out of one primary location and the dates are much more limited. So you'll need to be able to get away from your life's obligations based on the school schedule and not necessarily your own. If your primary goal is to earn a competition license as fast as possible and money is not an object, then a professional racing school will help you achieve your goal. Racing schools offer a variety of courses from modified Ford Mustangs, Mopars and Corvettes to open wheel single seaters. Google racing schools and compare reviews, schedules, and fee structures to determine which one best fits your needs and interests. Most of us will begin this pursuit by driving our personal car, usually a daily driver, on track in either autocross, a track day experience, or HPDE. I did this with my 2003 Porsche 911, and for the most part, it worked out well enough. After a few sessions though, if you feel this is gonna be something you'll stick with, the point quickly comes where you'll start pushing the car harder than you really want to. A street-focused daily driver, no matter what it is, will never be as competent on track as a simple, dedicated track car. Nor will it be as safe as a purpose-built track car with a roll cage and racing seats, should something go wrong. Also, the prospect of wrecking your daily driver and having no way to get home, much less getting to work the next day, becomes daunting. Understand that there is a significant difference between a simple track car and a dedicated race car. Any suitable car can be made to serve as an effective track car. Since our goal here is to get the competition license and go racing, we're going to need an actual race car. The fabrication and specifications will be dictated by the series you aim to compete in. Do your homework and study up on what specifications a potential race car must meet. Get a copy of the regulations from the series you plan on joining. Bear in mind, regulations can and often do change yearly or more. You won't want to spend your hard-earned money and time building your dream race car, only to find it won't qualify for the series you're planning on competing in, or perhaps any series at all. Believe me, I've seen it happen more than one time, where somebody purchased a car they thought would be a fantastic race car, only to find there was no race for them. Don't be that guy. If money is no object, there can be advantages to purchasing a simple car to learn the basics on and later, trade it in for a dedicated race car designed for the series you want to compete in. You can also purchase that track car 
and then convert it over time into a proper race car. The downside, however, is once again, you'll be spending a lot more money than if you just purchased someone else's completed car. For most of us, money is a factor, and if that's the case for you, you may want to purchase a race car from the start. This will also help you to gain familiarity with it, which will be helpful when you're competing against 50 or 60 other cars on track. You can always put street tires on in the beginning, working your way up through R compound tires like the Nitto NT01s, and finally, full racing slicks. This is a good time to mention that in racing, many parts of the car will time out long before they wear out. Things like seatbelts and even the seats themselves have expiration dates. The date of manufacture can usually be found on a label attached to the component. Find out what the maximum allowed time frame is for your series and make sure the car you do want to buy will be ready to go when you are. There's nothing wrong with buying a car which has already or will soon expire, but the price you pay needs to reflect that. Racing parts are crazy expensive. Even simple things like racing harnesses aren't that simple when you're the one paying for them. There are certain advantages to a fuel cell, most specifically the added safety they can provide. But fuel cells are very expensive and they do expire. My advice, stick with the factory fuel tank. So, as we've discussed, when the time comes to buy your first race car, good advice is to buy someone else's project. Race cars are notorious for losing value. And there's always something else that you'll either want to do or need to do. They are a money pit for sure. Don't build your own. Take it from someone who did. It's all too easy to spend $100,000 or more having a race car custom built for you. Sure, it's a lot of fun and the quality and fit will be top notch, but you'll never get that money back. Don't do it. Buy someone else's. It's usually very easy to find track and race cars for sale. For starters, you can search websites like racingjump.com, local club classifieds, or even the bathroom walls of many racetracks. Put out feelers amongst friends, instructors, the desk manager at your local racetrack, on HPD and race-oriented Facebook pages, there's always a car for sale. And remember, negotiate on price. Nobody ever gets what they're asking for. In particular, the Mazda Miata and BMW E36 make fantastic track and race cars. They are inexpensive to buy, oftentimes under $10,000 for a nice, ready-to-run example. Replacement parts are readily available and inexpensive, and there's no shortage of knowledgeable technicians available if you won't be working on the car yourself. Also, with a large number already out there, you'll find plenty of others at the track with spare parts in case you find yourself suddenly in need. Another major consideration is how many cars are running in the class you're hoping to compete in. In many states, Spec Miata and GTS racing feature large fields. This is important because it's a lot more fun competing against 10, 20, or even 60 participants than it is competing against maybe two or three. Larger fields also mean greater contingency winnings, which can include free tires, credit towards racing gear, or sometimes even cash. Top winners can earn a couple thousand dollars worth of goods in a weekend. Another word of advice here, don't fall for the frequent novice mistake of wanting a more powerful car to start with. The old adage about it being more fun to drive a slow car fast than a fast car slow, absolutely 100% applies here. Slower cars like a Miata or a BMW E36 are what's known as momentum cars. They don't have high horsepower and require you to stay off the brakes as much as possible, maintaining your momentum around the track. I promise you'll learn so much more and become a much better driver far faster taking this path. People who just have to start out with a Mustang GT, Corvette, or Porsche 911, or other similar high horsepower sports car, rarely get to push those cars to their potential. And if they do develop their skills to a high level, they will take a much longer time getting there. Start with a momentum car. So, now that you have a race car, you're gonna need a minimum amount of tools and equipment. Certain things you're gonna need from the beginning. A good helmet, a neck restraint, fire suit, fire retardant head sock and underwear and socks, racing shoes, and racing gloves. Also, you're gonna need supplies like a rubber storage tub, a quality professional duty tire gauge, a basic toolkit, a high quality torque wrench, window cleaner, paper towels, rain -X, sunscreen, water bottles, ice, blue painter's tape, extra clothing, sunshade, cap, and a folding chair. 
there's always something to buy. Only your budget and self-control will limit you. Of all the safety and convenience equipment you'll purchase over the coming years, the single most important item is your racing helmet, or as some affectionately call it, your brain bucket. Helmets span a wide price range with a corresponding variety in design and features. The single most important feature is the Snell SA rating. If a helmet does not prominently feature current Snell SA rating, walk away and never use a motorcycle or motocross helmet which are designed differently from auto racing helmets. A motorcycle crash looks very different from a race car crash and they are designed to crush and protect your head in very different ways. If you compromise everywhere else, never compromise on your helmet. Today's helmets utilize extensive amounts of quality carbon fiber to lighten the weight of the helmet. The lighter the helmet is, the more it will cost. You care about this because a helmet adds a lot of weight to your neck, shoulders, and spine. It makes a difference in simple, spirited driving, but as speeds and lateral forces build, the weight difference really multiplies and will make a noticeable difference on your body. It's not unusual to require a couple of days of recovery after a race weekend, especially your first year or so. A lighter helmet will certainly help you here. As I'm making this video in August 2020, the most recent Snell SA rating available is SA 2015. This rating is updated every five years, so SA 2020 helmets should be available around October of this year. Some racing organizations will allow you to use a helmet one update back, but not older. When purchasing equipment, you don't really know what you need until you know what you need. Buy the bare minimum in the beginning. There will be plenty of time to spend more money upgrading as you go along. You'll find that racing equipment like helmets, fire suits, and racing shoes can vary greatly in terms of comfort, fit, and quality. It's no fun spending a small fortune on something now only to wish you had bought something different later. A good race shop, while hard to find, can make all the difference. Check out shops like Winding Road, Competition Motorsport, and the like. You may pay a little bit more now for the same product than if you only shop and buy online, but I promise you the advice and attention a knowledgeable race shop employee brings to the table makes all the difference. It will actually be cheaper in the long run. Ask me how I know. Be sure to get your car tech inspected at an approved shop. It's always a good idea to get a brake flush and change the oil if it's near the end of its usefulness. Always change the oil after a track day as well, as the changes that happen to oil when it's being pushed on track can have a negative effect on its ability to protect your engine on the street. Be sure to get your car tech inspected at an approved shop. It's always a good idea to get a brake flush and change the oil if it's near the end of its usefulness. Always change the oil after a track day as well, as the changes that happen to oil when it's being punished on track can have a negative effect on its ability to protect your engine on the street. In addition, be sure you or your tech check everything on the list and address any issues that come up. Overheated brakes and boiling brake fluid are probably the most common failures you'll experience at beginner track days. A little money spent on them now can prevent the pain and suffering of going through a paid track weekend with no car to drive. Of course, there are a few things you'll want to bring along on your first track day, but the most important thing you can bring is a well-rested and properly hydrated driver. Proper preparation begins at least a day before the actual day. Drink water, lots of it, beginning no less than 24 hours prior to the time you'll arrive at the track. Remember, it takes around eight hours for the water you drink now to fully hydrate your body. Lack of hydration leads to poor concentration, headaches, and a host of other not good things. Hydrate and stay hydrated. Remember, you'll likely sweat a lot of water out of your body, so you're gonna need much more water than normal and get plenty of good, solid rest in the nights leading up to your track day. If you're doing a full track weekend, the same applies at the end of your first day on track. Avoid excessive alcohol. In fact, you're really better off not drinking any alcohol at all the night before you're driving on track. You'll want a sharp mind to be safe and fast. If your car can accommodate one, buy a large rubber tub that you can transport and store things in while at the track. Remember, you'll have to take everything out of your car before heading on track, so it's a real plus to have a sealed, watertight rubber tub to store your belongings in. Things like extra clothing, snacks, sunscreen, water bottles, tools, blue painter's tape, a tire pressure gauge, torque wrench, as well as window cleaner and paper towels. If it's gonna rain, bring along some rain -X. It'll really help. It's very common to experience a lot more wind in the open spaces of a racetrack facility than you were experiencing at home. 
leave home extra early. Unexpected delays tend to happen and you'll want to arrive at the track early. Expect delays at the guard gate where you'll have to sign liability waivers and receive a wristband. Once inside the facility, watch your speed. Most tracks have a five or 10 mile per hour speed limit. It's not uncommon to find kids at the track as well as distracted guests and the occasional amped up race car driver. Stay alert. If you don't have a garage rented, find a spot convenient to either the classroom and restroom area or to the starting grid. Set up your storage tub and folding chair, then back your car into your space. Now's the time to take a stroll around the facility, familiarize yourself with the layout and make some introductions. Being mindful of the time, head over to the sign-in desk to complete your registration, receive your driver's group-specific wristband, instructor assignment, and schedule. Remember, if you're not early, you're late. Arriving early will help you to be more relaxed all weekend. Take it all in. This marks the beginning of a journey you've probably been dreaming about for a long, long time. Today, you're taking the steps to get yourself to the green flag and eventually the checker flag. I'm gonna leave you with a few tips I've learned over the years. Things I share with all my students every weekend I'm on track. If you remember and practice any of these, you'll have a much better time. And after all, isn't that the point? If you're not early, you're late. As I said, always arrive at the track early and arrive to grid 15 minutes before your scheduled start time. Write your grid times down on your wristband. That way, you'll always have your schedule handy. Remember, you can't finish first if you don't finish. Be smart. The point right now is to learn and to survive. You're not gonna set any speed records today, so don't be a fool, don't even try. Slow in, fast out. A very common mistake newbies make, and one I did myself for longer than I care to admit, is they overdrive their car. This means entering turns too fast, screeching around a turn, destroying your tires while killing your speed. Break in a straight line, then turn in towards the apex. When you reach the apex, the point where you are once again starting to straighten out your steering wheel, gradually unwind the wheel while simultaneously applying more throttle. Be the king of smooth. A big reason six-time Formula One world champion driver Lewis Hamilton is able to make his tires last longer and his lap times lower is because he's so smooth. Abrupt throttle, braking, and steering inputs will slow you down and wear both you and your car out. Smooth is the goal. Smooth is fast. Always maintain situational awareness. I tell every one of my students, never follow the car in front of you. And yet, I see it happen all the time. If you follow the car in front of you, it's quite likely you're gonna find yourself heading into a turn much faster than either you or your car can handle. That oh crap moment is not something you like to experience, believe me. Don't follow the car in front of you. Follow your own pace, be alert. And don't drive your mirrors, drive in front. Look ahead, look where you want to go, look through the turn in front of you. Yes, you want to have tremendous situational awareness. You need to know what's going on around you, in front, behind, and on the sides. But don't drive your mirrors. I see people make this mistake all the time, where they're looking in the mirror instead of where they're going. That doesn't usually end very well. Be predictable. One of the most important things you can do for others on track is be predictable. Stay on your line. Follow your line and stay on your line. If an emergency comes up and you need to get off track, make sure you use the proper hand signals. If you suddenly find yourself having a mechanical problem or dropping oil, take yourself offline at the very side of the track so you won't cause problems for other people. Also be sure to put up the proper hand signals so the drivers behind you know what's going on. Never ever stop on track unless told to do so by the corner workers. If there's a wreck in front of you, do your best to go around it. You don't want to stop on track. If you do so, it's a good chance you're going to get hit by a lot more cars behind you. And again, that's not something that works out well. Take notice of where every flag stand and corner worker is on your outlap. Wave at the corner workers, the people holding the flags. Wait with them again after the checker on your cooldown lap. You know, we have a saying in racing, no wave, no save. There's no point in you testing that saying. 
There's a reason all these cliches stick around. It's because they're true. Finally, when that great day comes along that you are presented with your competition license, remember, steady wins the race. Don't be a first place or crash kind of guy. That's stupid. I finished with the most points in my second full season, despite only achieving a handful of podium spots. But I drove smart and consistent. I stayed out of trouble, didn't wreck my car or other racers' cars, and I finished. I finished every race, every time, and consistently. Every organization has one crazy guy who doesn't understand we're not racing for multi-million dollar McLaren or Red Bull racing contracts. Don't be that guy. It doesn't take skill to wreck other people or trash your own equipment. Nobody appreciates a menace. At most clubs, you get a cheap little plastic trophy. Heck, I've even gotten a couple of glass mugs, if you can believe that. Be predictable, respectable, responsible, and upstanding. And of course, always drive your best. Get good instruction frequently and from as many different instructors as you can find. You'll learn a lot. It's a bonus to expose yourself to different philosophies and different styles until you find your own. And remember, a smart driver never stops learning. Even the top drivers with tremendous successes under their belts usually maintain a driving coach on payroll. You can stop learning when you retire. Well, this concludes your introduction to auto racing. I hope you enjoyed this video and that you've not only learned some things, but that you are now even more inspired and excited to begin the journey than ever before. Auto racing is a fantastic sport made up of a tremendous group of people. There will be great days, bad days, and, and a bunch of regular days. But one thing is for certain, once you've joined this incredible community, the memories you create every weekend will change your life in ways you can't even imagine. It's a blast. If you've come this far, please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Also, please check back in the future and let me know how your journey went. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider liking and subscribing below so you won't miss our next episode. Have fun, be safe, and I'll see you out there.